Well, it's week 14 of our online gatherings and we are uh, glad you're here with us and we're glad we can do this again. We are one week closer to being back. Um, some of you may have heard from our government that uh, there are some plans for the church to be back uh, within the next few weeks. Uh, we are working together as elders to work out how that works and what that looks like. We have been doing that for a number of weeks and we were waiting for further guidelines from them. but be excited and um, there's light at the end of this tunnel and so we are working towards that and we will let you know in due course about that but we are glad you're here and uh, we're glad that we can do this again and we'd love you to make a comment like and share this post as normal and uh, to get this out and to share this with as many people as we can and to invite them in to join us um, as we meet online like this we pray that you're all keeping well and safe uh, in these days as well that you're all okay um we are just so pleased that we are making some progress through this season aren't we there's uh things positive things that are happening around us that are proving that maybe we are uh, making our way through uh, the coronavirus season uh, and this pandemic but we're here and we want to worship we want to praise we want to praise god for all his goodness to us in song and as we pray together um, and as we open god's word in the moment as we continue through our Ephesians series. We're going to do that uh, a, little, a little later on in our online gathering. But at this point, we're going to hand over to uh, our music group again, and they're going to lead us in our first song.
covered in your love your grace is enough for me for me let's take a few minutes to pray together and then we'll hand over to Chloe who's going to do our KBC Kids Talk this week. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can, although separated, sing your praises. We can raise our voices and enjoy uh, worshipping your name in this way. Lord, we come in now and we worship you in prayer. We give you thanks for who you are. That you are a, a holy, perfect, almighty God who loves us unconditionally. Lord, we are so unlovable, yet you love us so much that you gave us your only begotten son that uh, if we trust in you, that we would have life eternal. We would have you as friend and saviour as we walk through this life on this earth and we would know that hope that when this time on earth is done, we have you, we will be with you, we will worship your son forever. Lord, we thank you for these wonderful truths, simple as they are. Lord, they fill us with joy. And today, we may be filled with joy. May we rejoice in this day because you have made it. This is your day that is set apart where we may enjoy a day that is different to the rest and come in and worship you. Lord, we do confess that we are nothing, yet you have called us your treasured possession. Lord, we do come in and we ask that you forgive our sins, the things that we've done, things that we haven't done this week. Lord, we ask that you would uh, cleanse us afresh this morning. Lord, that you would make us white as snow and wipe the slate clean. Lord, we, we do thank you that you are a forgiving God, one who forgives our sins. Lord, we do pray for the world around us. All of this going on, all the uncertainty, as we've prayed over all of these weeks, may you bring peace and clarity. May you give the church's guidance as well as we figure out what will happen in the next number of weeks with regard to getting back to meeting together face to face. May we do that wisely and sensibly, protecting our flock. Lord, we do pray for our governments as they work all these things out, but we also pray for them in regards to laws that are being passed in these days which are against your will. Lord, we fear for our country. We pray like Isaiah prayed. Lord, that you would look upon us with favour. Lord, that yes, we are a people of unclean lips and a nation of unclean lips, but Lord, we pray that you would, you would uh, spare us and, and guide us and speak into our governments, we pray. Lord, as we, we fight for the unborn, and our governments stand against that. Lord, may we continue to strive for justice. You're a just God, and we should be a people who love justice. And Lord, we pray that, that uh, you would help us to continue to pray for our governments in these difficult times. Lord, we do pray for those closer to home, those who are struggling with anxiety and fear, loneliness, Lord, we pray that you be with them, young and old. Lord, that you would guide us through these next few weeks and help us to resume a certain sense of normality as time goes on and as restrictions go back and they ease. Lord, may you help us in these days. Lord, we long to be back together. May we make steps towards that, we pray. Guide us now. Help us as we open your word in a few minutes' time. You may speak to us as we think about our old life, the way of the world, and the new life, the way of Christ. May this be true and re a reality for us. And may we be practical in putting these steps into place to put on Christ. Lord, we pray you'll be with Chloe as she shares now, the boys and girls. But the, we pray for the boys and girls as they listen to her. That this will be an encouragement and a blessing to them, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. So yes, we're going to hand over to Chloe now. And she's going to share with the boys and girls. And uh, we just want to say at this point before I do that, that next weekend, God, God willing, is going to be our Children's Day. And so we're going to um, have different things on the stream, on this live uh, online gathering. 
uh, where you're going to see the boys and girls and what they've been up to over these last number of weeks. So if you are going to be part of that, I encourage you to get uh, your videos in or pictures or whatever it may be that you need to send to your Sunday school teachers. Go and do that because we need to put that all together this week. And we look forward to seeing you all next week on the stream. But for now, over to Chloe for the KBC Kids Talk. Hi, boys and girls. I hope you're well and looking forward to school being over for summer. I know I am. This morning, we are going to play a game. I'm going to show you some pictures and I want you to guess what they are. Ready? Here's the first one. What's this? It looks a bit strange, doesn't it? This is Ben's nose. What about this one? This is a towel. What about this one then? Hmm, this is a bit trickier. This is a basket. Last one. What about this? I'm sure you're thinking, that's really easy. It's just a button. But what if I asked you, where's the button off? Is it off a coat or a dress? Or maybe something completely different? What do you think? You'll have to wait and see. Sometimes when we look at a picture, it's really hard to imagine what was happening when it was taken. Or sometimes something happens, usually something that really hurts or makes us sad or angry. And we begin to wonder, why has God let that happen? There's a man in the Bible who had to wait a long time for something to happen. And I'm sure there were times when he began to wonder if it was ever going to happen. His name was David. God anointed David through Samuel and promised him that he was going to be the next king of Israel. David wasn't very old when he was anointed. Maybe he was just a teenager, we're not too sure. But he had to wait because Israel already had a king at the time. His name was Saul. David trusted God though and waited. He killed Goliath and joined King Saul's army. He even married Saul's daughter and became really good friends with his son Jonathan. But King Saul became very jealous of David. He didn't like how the people really liked David and didn't like him as much. He was so jealous that he tried to kill David. So David had to run away and he hid. He didn't want to kill Saul even though he knew that he would be the next king. He was waiting and trusting God. But Saul didn't give up. He kept chasing David and he kept trying to kill David for, ver for many years. But David kept hiding from him. I'm guessing it was during these years that David might have wondered if he would ever be king or even why God was letting this happen to him. But David continued to trust God. In Psalm 25 verses 1 and 2, David wrote, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Can you say that with me? Psalm 25 verses 1 and 2. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. David knew that he could trust God that God was with him and that God would keep his promise and make David king and that God had a plan. Remember how God created the whole world. He made everything, he knows everything and he sees everything. When something happens that we don't understand, God knows. God sees the whole picture. Just like when you were guessing where this button was from, I could see the whole picture came from here. God did keep his promise to David. He became king of Israel when he was 30 years old. He had a lot of years to wait for that to happen, but he kept trusting God. You can trust him too with everything that happens, just like David. When something happens that you don't understand, pray to God and ask him to help you trust him. You might never understand why it has happened, but I want you to always remember 
God knows everything and has a reason for everything. God sees the whole picture. Well, today is part 17 of our series and uh, we want to turn today to Ephesians 4, verse 17 through 24. So Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. So go and get your Bible, turn it up and turn this passage up and we're going to read this together uh, now. So chapter 4, verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in the true righteousness and holiness. Let's pray. Father, we desire this new life, this new self, this new uh, wardrobe that we see here. So may now we put off, we take off the old life and put on the new for your glory. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, fashion is a, is a worldwide fascination Fashion is a worldwide fascination. Whether you travel to Belfast or London or Geneva or Beijing or Nairobi, you will find fashion conscious people making fashion statements. Japan, for instance, and you can go and look this up, has become an obsessively clothes conscious culture. See, the typical Japanese golfer, if you're into golf, he dares not step onto a golf course apart from wearing thousands of pounds worth of designer clothing. Now that may have something to do with the 400 plus green fees, 400 pound plus, plus green fees out there. But in our culture, the idea of new clothes for some is an exciting prospect. And behind that excitement, I think, lives an idea that new clothes means in some ways a new you, a new me. And we've all seen the adverts, right, on TV. The adverts and the programs even that show a perfect transformation of a person who once lacked confidence uh, to a person who, having a full makeover, exudes in their new you look. And this type of current day promotion sells. It sells well. This dreamy idea of a makeover making us a new woman or man is tempting for many. And we are enticed by it. And in many ways, there's no huge issues with that. But the only problem is this. Not only does clothing not make a man or a woman, it covers up the real you. See, clothing can polish the image, but not the soul. And in today's text, Paul's, Paul talks here about clothing. He talks about the Christian's wardrobe. I don't know whether you ever thought you had a wardrobe, but, not, but here he's not talking about the physical wardrobe, the clothes, but the spiritual clothes that we wear. And this is therefore a divine wardrobe. And in this wardrobe, you'll find clothes for the new race. Remember we talked about that? The new citizenship, the new Christians, these are the clothes we're going to be talking about today, the ones we need to wear. But this new wardrobe that Paul brings us isn't going to go out of fashion, you will be glad to hear. It will never go out of date. Actually, it's a wardrobe that will grow increasingly better over time. But 
before we put on the new clothes, before we find out what they are, we need to shed our old clothes. You can't possibly wear both wardrobes at the same time. That would be dark. So we need to get rid of the old and be fully committed to wearing the new. So to do this, we need to be reminded, firstly, what the old clothes look like, what they look like. So let's look at this. My first point, the old wardrobe, verse 17 to 20. Let's read these verses together, I think, again, as we have done just a moment ago, as a contrast to the new, because we're going to look at old and new today. So let's read these first, and then we'll continue looking at the new in a minute. Verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And I'll leave verse 20, I think, for for a minute because that will bridge the two wardrobes. I was going to read that, but I think we'll leave it for now. Well, it's sad, isn't it, in our day and age that actually this old wardrobe, these descriptions are still very much in fashion, just as it was in Paul's day, obviously, as he wrote them. That is why Paul is so adamant that the Christian, as it says here, no longer walks as the Gentiles do. Let's think about that phrase from Paul for a moment. Firstly, the no longer walk. Does that ring any bells? See, it's a direct connection, isn't it, to that which we looked at a few weeks ago when we studied Ephesians 4, verse 1. There, in that verse, Paul calls us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we are called. See, back then, I said the rest of the letter would reveal how to do that, how to walk out. However, I didn't say that it would reveal what not to do in order to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. But here, it is explicit that we are to not walk in these ways in order that we may walk in the way that is worthy, the Lord's appointed walk and way. Paul strong, uses strong words here, doesn't he, to drive this truth home. The fact that he testifies in the Lord, as he says here, tells us that Paul is saying that the Christian cannot go any further on their walk without making an ethical decision. Therefore, this is a pinnacle moment, isn't it, in this letter. Do not live like this, that's what Paul is saying, but live like this. So you make this decision in your life. And then the rest of this letter, which we will look at over the weeks, God willing, will give you the details of how, how to walk it out. Also, Paul's strong directive would have been read by the church leaders to the Gentiles. And I picture myself reading this to the church. And it seems incredibly awkward as is in the English. It tells us here, doesn't it, that it, actually we read it as Paul talking to the Gentiles in the presence of Gentiles. How rude does that seem? He's talking about Gentiles in the Gentile audience. But we must know that the word Gentiles here in verse 1 can be used to talk uh, about an ethnic group of people, but it can also talk, be talked and used about, you used to, to talk about the uh, morals of a person. And that's what Paul is talking about here. See, the description that we have just read is the character, the attitude, the position and lifestyle of the pagan, the Gentile. The one who lives and worships whoever they want, whenever they want, however they want. John Stott, if you'd allow me to use his thoughts here in my sermon for a moment. He saw these verses, these descriptions, as a downward spiral that begins, as we see here, Firstly, with hardness of heart, and then moves to darkness of heart, and then to deadness, and finally, 
recklessness. Four things that add to this downward spiral. So we have hardness, darkness, deadness, and recklessness. Stop. He outlines here, and how he has done that is brilliant. And I wouldn't want and didn't want to search for a better one or think of a better one to describe these verses. So I want, if you will let me, to borrow his headings just for a few moments. Firstly, hardness. It is incredibly sad that because of sin, man's heart at its very core is hard. As verse 18 here describes, it says they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardness of heart. Well, the word hardness here was known in the original language to mean a stone harder than marble. In our own English language, we might call it a heart of stone. You may have heard that phrase before. But what is hardness of heart referring to here? What does Paul mean here? What are they hardened against? Maybe that's a better question. Well, in verse 18, we know that it is talking about the people's unwillingness to respond to God's truth. Their unwillingness to respond to God's truth. Romans 1 and 18 is a parallel text. And I want to read this to you now. And it says this. Men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The word suppression or suppress is a better way maybe to understand this hardness. Let me tell you a short story that maybe will help you. There's a story of a young boy who had a dog. All he ever wanted was his parents to allow him to have his dog sleep in his bedroom for a night. So the parents not allowing this to happen, he without their permission, sneak the dog into the room. Then, in the distance, he heard his parents coming up the stairs and walking towards his room. So, he quickly took the dog and hid him in the toy box, closing the lid and sitting on top of it. His mum and dad came in, thinking it was a little strange, but they began to talk together. But all the time they were talking, there were repeated thumps, and noises coming from underneath him, made of course by this poor pet who was stuck in the toy box. The boy was trying to hide, to avoid, and to suppress what he knew. Well, Paul is saying to us and to the church here today that the Gentile, the pagan person, is like this, suppressing the truth, ignoring the realities of God that sit right before us, well, secondly, then, Stott says that we see darkness here in the Gentile lifestyle, in that pagan lifestyle. Look at verse 18 again, and it says this. They are darkened in their understanding. This word understanding here is not that they have, or didn't have, should I say, intellect to understand. No, no, that's not what it's saying. But it's saying that they didn't possess the Spirit of God, which allows them to understand the things of God. But what is interesting here is this. Paul, in his other book, which he wrote, which is called Romans, in Romans, he claimed many, or many claimed, he says, to be wise. And in doing so, they became fools. But what did he mean by that? He meant that the more you suppress the truth, the less capable you are of discerning spiritual realities and spiritual truths. Well, then thirdly, start, if I can continue to use his outline here, says that hardness and darkness lead to deadness. Paul says in verse 18 that the Gentile is alienated from God, from the life of God. This has to be, I think, one of the most devastating phrases in this passage. Why? You see, because alienation thing that separates us from God makes anything and everything possible and I mean that in the most negative way. 
See, what Isaiah said in chapter 5 and 20 solidifies this by saying that those in this death state can call evil good and good evil and to put darkness for light and light for darkness. That's what Isaiah says and how devastating that is. Well then, Stott's fourth and final observation that we're going to use this morning is this. It was recklessness. Look at verse 19. It says this. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. Well, the callousness of the people here speaks volumes, doesn't it? It literally means beyond feeling, like a calloused skin. There is no doubt that callousness here is a result of hardness of heart. It's like going beyond pain, if you can imagine that, where nothing hurts anymore. No sin affects their thoughts or feelings anymore. They're conscious, they're con their conscience. They are without emotion and feeling. That's a scary place to be. And Paul focuses in here, particularly on sensuality. That's the word he uses here. And that, are, that is the things that pleases the human senses. And in this, content, in this context, I think it's a warning to the church and away from the gentle habit of living in sexual sin. They were greedy, meaning they desired more and more and more to indulge in every sensually impure thing. Well, these verses are a pretty depressing picture of what we were and maybe what you still are. These were the things you wore and the things that determined the path of your life. The hardness of heart prevented your loyalty to God. A heart that is insensitive to God has set off a chain reaction that turned out the light, it turned off the light and led to a meaningless life. But, and this is an important but, look at verse 20. But that is not the way you learned Christ. That is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. The Ephesian church was taught the exact opposite to what the world has learned by learning of Jesus Christ. Notice Paul's clever wording here and how it puts Jesus in the center of what they know. Can you see it there in the Bible? Paul saying that they learned Christ. We know that he was the subject of their lesson. By Paul saying, assuming that you have heard about him here, we know that Jesus was the teacher. And by Paul saying here that they were taught in him, we know that Jesus was the atmosphere if you like the very thing that encompasses them well all their teaching from the apostles was in Jesus that is how they were taught totally centered on and in Jesus this experience is powerful it was uh, the same for St. Patrick as he said this in the fifth century listen to this Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. The Ephesian church was charged with everything it needed to keep them from this perilous spiral of the world as we have seen today plunging into recklessness into reckless sin well, instead of hardness and darkness and deadness and recklessness they were to have tenderness and light and life and abandonment to everything except an upward spiral not a downward one. Okay, having seen the wardrobe 
uh, that we have seen here, the old wardrobe. My second main point today is this, the new wardrobe, verse 21 to 24. Well, what were the results of the instruction to have Christ, to know Christ and to live Christ? What were the results of those things? We'll look at verse 21 to 24. In verse 21 we see it says, You were taught to put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Well, in verse 23 then we see this, to be renewed, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And in verse 24, and to be put on the new self, created in the likeness of God in the true righteousness and holiness. Let's look briefly at these three results of putting on this new wardrobe. Firstly, Paul told them to put off, to take off the old self, the old clothes which you used to wear, that old person. The sense in which Paul is instructing them here is not a one-off event, but a continuing to put off, to take off those old clothes, those old ways. That's the sense that we see that Paul is writing these things. See, there's never been a soul, a person who has succeeded in shedding, in putting off the old garments entirely with a single, unrepeated action. A person doesn't exist. Those of us who live for Christ are ready to repeat, and we should be ready to repeat, the putting offs until glory. Maybe pride or jealousy or bitterness or covetousness, maybe lust or all their relatives. They need to be killed off daily. John Owen, an old English theologian, said this, Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. Secondly, in verse 23, we need to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. That's what it says. Between putting off and putting on, this renewal must be accomplished. We cannot put on and live this new birth life unless our thinking is altered and renewed. Some of you will know what Paul says in Romans 12 and 2. I'm going to read it to you. It says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable, and perfect. This is accomplished by time in God's word, an earnest prayer that the Holy Spirit would renew our minds. That's that simple. Time in his word, prayer that the Holy Spirit would renew us. Well then finally, in verse 24, we have the putting on of our new clothes, our new nature, our new lifestyle, our new Christ living. At birth, we wore the old man, the old nature, the devastating nature that we saw at the very beginning of this message. But those who are Christians no longer have this because they are new creations in Christ Jesus. The old has gone and the new has come. Yes, we will put off that old nature. We will kill it daily. But we have a new nature that we now live with. So we possess the contents of a new wardrobe. Now we must work hard at wearing it. We must work hard at weaving it into our daily lives. This is not simply a process of putting off the old world, the old self and its attractions. But there is a further part to play. And it is in wearing and living out of this new you. We need to put on love and peace and joy and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. They are the fruit of the Spirit. God desires that the fruit of the Spirit is evident in, the, in his church, in his people, for his ultimate glory and fame. And by putting on, I want us to think maybe like this. When I lose my temper with our daughter Annabeth, and I'll hold my hand up to say that that happens from time to time, I need to repent of that and put that old me to death. 
And then I need to complete my responsibility by putting on love and patience. It is no good doing the first half without doing the second. See, by God's grace, may he help us to do this because we need his help in doing it. We cannot do anything to earn or keep our salvation. That is only by God's grace alone. But as Paul says in Philippians, we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let's work out, work it out, our salvation in our life. It's time to get to work continually putting off the old self and continually putting on the new. Being very aware of the old nature, putting that to death, killing that. And for some of you, it will mean removing all that is in your wardrobe today, all that old stuff, and praying that God, by his saving grace, his amazing grace, would make you a new creation by forgiving your sin, giving you new life, new morals, new priorities, new desires, new clothes to wear, that you may glorify him in your life. And may we, those who love Christ, be teachable people in these days as we read and are renewed by his word through his Holy Spirit. And then stepping out into this dark Gentile world with bright, shining garments of light. Church, put on who we say we are, who Christ says we are. Father, that's our prayer. Will you help us by your spirit to put on who you say we are? We will continually shed the old life. We will kill it off. We will get rid of the way we used to act and think and do because we have a new life now in Christ, a new wardrobe, new morals, new desires, new priorities new ways of thinking, new ways of doing. Lord, help us daily to fight this battle. We will may, may always put on the new every day and walk out as lights shining for you in this dark, Gentile world. Help us to do that, we pray. Go before us this week, we ask. Help us to do these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. 